Thank you very much indeed, Robert, and thank you very much to all of you for coming along here this afternoon. As Robert has just said, it's almost exactly a year since I last had the privilege of speaking here at UCL, and I'm absolutely delighted to return here today. Uh, today of all days, the 11th of February, which I understand is the anniversary of the foundation of this great university. So it is an appropriate occasion for me to make my return here. Uh, there's also a very strong Scottish connection uh, here since two of the key figures in establishing UCL were, of course, Scots, Thomas Campbell and Lord Broome and I hope you'll forgive me for uh, very gently reminding you that when uh, you, UCL, were being established as England's third university, Scotland already had five <laughs> universities. <laughs> um, as you've probably all noticed, uh, I would hope you've all noticed, there's quite a lot that has changed in Scotland since I was last here. It has in fact been a truly momentous 12 months uh, in Scottish politics. In fact, I would uh, put it uh, slightly differently to that. It's been a truly momentous 12 months for Scotland uh, as a whole. And as you might also have noticed, not all of the momentous events over the past 12 months turned out exactly as I would have wanted. Um, I should say I would much rather be returning here today as the Deputy First Minister of a country that had just voted for independence. Uh, but that aside, it is an enormous pleasure and a great privilege indeed to come back here to address you as First Minister. Now, what has happened in Scotland over the past year will obviously influence what I want to talk about this afternoon. But my speech today is going to cover issues which are of relevance not just in Scotland but across the whole of the UK. I want to speak today about the state of our economy, the state and structure of our society and about the nature of future economic growth. And I want to make three fundamental arguments today. Uh, firstly, I'm going to talk about something that I believe is not talked about nearly enough and that is the impact of austerity on people, on individuals. I don't believe that any economic policy can be seen as a success when it causes severe anxiety and suffering to so many people, including so many of our most vulnerable citizens. And secondly, I'll argue that even if you somehow felt able to set aside the human cost of austerity, the current UK government's economic policy has failed even on its own terms. It has failed to reduce the deficit as planned and it has failed even more comprehensively to rebalance the economy. And finally, I want to talk about what that means for the future. Why the Scottish Government rejects the current Westminster proposals for even more austerity and how we want to approach creating a fairer and a more prosperous country. But I want to begin with the point that I would suggest underpins all of those arguments. Talking about the deficit in isolation as the Westminster parties are doing, in my view misses the point. Economic policy is, should be, a means not an end. Economic policy is the means by which citizens can live happy, healthy and fulfilling lives. And one of the things that I encountered time and time and time again during last year's referendum campaign, indeed this is the sentiment which came to dominate the entire debate, was the overwhelming desire to create a fairer society as well as a more prosperous country. And that desire came from many no voters incidentally, as well as from uh, yes voters. And I am absolutely uh, sure and I know that that desire extends well beyond Scotland's boundaries as well. But one of the reasons why the referendum was such an electrifying and exhilarating experience, and believe me it was uh, an electrifying and exhilarating experience, was that during that campaign we got the chance to ask really big and really fundamental questions about the sort of society we wanted to live in. 
And everybody in Scotland, including 16-year-olds who'd never had the chance to vote before and many older people who hadn't voted perhaps for 30 years or ever in their lives before, knew that they had a voice that would be heard in a decision that really, really mattered. And the consequence of all of that was a huge surge in engagement and political confidence that, regardless of the result of the referendum, I believe will benefit Scotland, not just for years, but probably for decades to come. And here's the thing, when you emerge from a debate as wide-ranging, as passionate, and as fundamental as that one was, the discussions and the debates that dominate <coughs> Westminster politics can and do seem bizarrely and depressingly narrow. Uh, the entire focus of the Westminster debate is on the deficit. Now, the deficit is hugely important. You won't hear me denying that. But it's a symptom of economic difficulties, not just a cause of them. And it can't be seen entirely in isolation. <coughs> Scotland, just like the UK as a whole, and indeed other countries around the world, faces deep, interrelated, complex challenges. The deficit is certainly one of those challenges, but so too is boosting productivity, ensuring skilled and well-paid job opportunities, adapting to an ageing population, combating inequality, and moving to the low-carbon age. Trying to tackle the deficit while ignoring those other challenges makes no sense. And much UK policy over the last five years has, so it seems to me, asked the wrong question. How do we cut spending as quickly as possible? And inevitably, it has arrived very often at the wrong answers. The result has been policies which target the vulnerable, hinder growth, and constrain rather than build our economic potential. You know, back in 2010, the Chancellor famously said that we're all in this together. He said that too often when countries undertake major consolidations of this kind, it's the poorest, those who had least to do with the cause of the economic misfortunes, who are hit hardest. He went on to say, this coalition government will be different. Well, it hasn't been different. Far from it. You know, two weeks ago, the IFS published an analysis of the tax and benefit changes that have been made by the coalition, and it found that the changes have harmed the poorest, the poorest 10% of households more than any other section of the population. And that's not the only inequity. Research by the House of Commons Library last year showed that women are disproportionately affected. They're bearing more than three quarters of the impact of tax and welfare changes. Disabled people are also losing out. In Scotland, it's estimated that more than half of all those who claim disability living allowance are going to see their income cut by at least £1,100 a year. So it's simply and manifestly untrue to say that we're all in this together. Uh, we're not. The cuts have had a disproportionate impact on women, disabled people and those on low incomes. Uh, put quite simply, the most vulnerable are bearing the heaviest burden. In my view, that human cost is in itself too high a price to pay for current policies. You know, I see the consequences of that human cost each and every week in my constituency surgeries. But what makes it even worse is that these policies are not actually serving their wider purpose. And that's the second point I want to make this afternoon. The UK government's economic policy uh, has failed by its own terms categorically and comprehensively. And as I say, that's not by my reckoning, but it is on the UK government's own terms. You know, it's worth remembering that back in 2010, the UK government didn't promise an ideological war to shrink the state. It promised to rebalance the economy. David Cameron promised to address the situation where, and I quote, our economy has become more and more unbalanced with our fortunes hitched to a few industries in one corner of the country. The Chancellor promised a rebirth in manufacturing with the economy carried aloft by the march of the makers. But none of these structural changes in our economy has actually happened. It's maybe worth looking firstly at regional imbalances. Now, it's important to say and to say very clearly, and not just because I happen to be here, uh, that London is one of the great world cities. It's an extraordinary hub of commerce, innovation and achievement. And this city's success brings benefits to the broader UK economy, including to Scotland's. 
economy. But it's also hard to ignore the fact that London exerts an almost overwhelming gravitational pull on talent, investment and business from the rest of Europe and the world. And that poses a challenge for all parts of the UK. Now, Scotland actually fares better than many other parts of the UK. We're currently the third most prosperous part of the UK behind London and the South East, partly, of course, because we have our own parliament and we can take certain steps to boost our own economy. But London's GDP per head is still 80% higher than ours. Over the past five years, London has continued to outperform the rest of the country for job creation and growth. And so we need to compete. It's not about moaning about it, it's about making sure we have the ability to compete more effectively with that. That's why the Scottish Government argues so strongly for more job creating powers to be held in the hands of the Scottish Parliament. And although we are disappointed with how few new responsibilities are proposed for devolution, we will always seek to use the levers we have, not to engage in some kind of race to the bottom, but to create long-term competitive advantage. And if our successful example can encourage greater decentralisation elsewhere in the UK, we would warmly welcome that, because at the moment the UK has the deepest regional imbalances in Europe. And that's just one of the challenges we need to address. Social inequality is damagingly high. Manufacturing across the UK is still below pre-recession levels, so is GDP per head. The current account deficit, which is a key measure of trade and income flows with the rest of the world, is worse than at any previous point in the UK's history. And perhaps uh, most damaging of all for the UK government's credibility, it's failed to meet its own deficit reduction targets. In 2010, the Chancellor predicted that the UK would be running a budget surplus on its current spending of £6 billion next year. He now expects a deficit of £49 billion. In total, over the six years to March 2016, the Chancellor is likely to miss his borrowing targets by £150,000 million. That's a mistake for every single person in the UK of almost £2,500. But now, when the evidence tells us that austerity hasn't worked, the UK government is now telling us that we actually need even more of it. Uh, under UK government plans, the cuts we've seen to date would be uh, much smaller than what is yet to come. Even under opposition proposals, a further £30 billion of cuts would be required over the first two years of the next parliament. Uh, the IFS put this into perspective in its green budget last week. It looked at 32 advanced economies and found that the UK government's fiscal consolidation plans were the largest of them all. Now, there are three things about this. Firstly, I've already talked about the human cost of austerity, the consequences for public services, for families and individuals, and that impact will get worse. Again, according to the IFS, the cuts still to come are likely to be 35% bigger than the cuts we've already seen. And the second point is this. Why should we believe that the UK government will succeed in reducing the deficit as they plan? Because the previous austerity package has failed to do so. And if you look at the detail of the current projections, there are some obvious, very obvious doubts. A good example is productivity. We all know that improving productivity and output per hour worked is essential to any sustainable increase in living standards. But the UK's productivity has scarcely improved at all during the economic recovery. It's still lower now than it was in 2008. Even the OBR has said that it's hard to judge when or if productivity growth will return to its historical average. Deep spending cuts will hurt investment in skills, innovation and infrastructure. So they're more likely to hit productivity than to help it. But we've heard no explanation of how productivity increases will be achieved. Austerity has become an article of faith, but we don't need austerity as an article of faith. I would argue we need a strategy for growth. And the third and final point uh, on this issue is this. Even if the government meets its forecast for public debt, the consequences for household debt will be severe. We all know that economic growth in the past relied too much on debt and credit. But that problem is likely to get even worse in the next few years as a direct result of government policy. 
And the reason is, is quite clear. There are four major components of economic growth. Public spending, exports, business investment and household spending. Now of these, public spending is being cut, exports are likely to be subdued, businesses remain cautious, although some investment is expected. So most of the economic growth the UK government is expecting will come from household consumption. But in a time of low wage increases and high inequality, that will only happen if household spending rises more quickly than household incomes. And that will lead to an increase in debt. In fact, the OBR predicts that by 2020, UK households will be more heavily indebted than they were before the financial crisis. Average household debt will be 184% of income in 2020. In 2008, that figure was 169%. It's worth really thinking about what that means. The Chancellor is making unprecedented cuts to public spending and the public services on which all of us rely. He's doing so in the name of fiscal responsibility, yet his entire economic model depends on individual households taking on more debt than at any time in history. Instead of pooling risk, the government is dispersing it to households across the country. Individuals will be deeper in debt, families will feel less secure, the economy will be less resilient. I think it's morally unjustifiable and it's economically unsustainable. So that's why the Scottish Government proposes a very different approach. It's worth noting though, before I go on to what that different approach is, that the Scottish Government has actually balanced its own budget every single year. Now yes, that is partly because we've got no choice, but... <laughs> but... But there is a serious point here. It does bring with it a fiscal discipline that is good for government. And it has required genuinely tough decisions. The fact that you have to do something actually doesn't in and of itself make it easy to do it. You have to make tough decisions. Mm. Uh, and by and large, on the whole, with some exceptions, but on the whole, we've carried people with us because the policies we've adopted have clearly had a sense of fairness at their heart. Now, in terms of the UK economy, we believe that debt and the deficit should be reduced as a percentage of GDP, but more gradually than either of the largest UK parties is proposing. For example, if you limited real terms growth in public spending to half a percent each year, not King's ransom, half a percent in real terms, then that would still reduce debt and deficit as a share of GDP in every year from 2016-17. But it would also permit, compared to current UK government plans, a further £180 billion of investment across the UK over the next four years. Now with that investment, we could protect the infrastructure, education and innovation that will support stronger and more sustainable growth in the future. And we could take a different approach to the crude cuts that reduce work incentives and impact directly on disabled people and families with children. We could manage the deficit down but without destroying the social fabric. And of course we could also release savings through some straightforward choices. Deciding not to renew Trident, for example, would save around £100 billion at 2012 prices over the next 35 years. Now, the Trident Commission last year estimated that the equivalent annual cost of a new Trident system will be almost £3 billion. The cash cost will peak at £4 billion in the mid-2020s. Imagine what we could do with that money if we invested it not in nuclear weapons, but instead in health and education and in better childcare. So by taking a different approach, by offering an alternative to the austerity agenda of both Labour and the Tories, we would ensure that fiscal consolidation is consistent with a wider vision of society. A society that strives to become more equal as part of becoming more prosperous. We simply don't accept that there has to be a trade-off between balancing the books and having a balanced society. Fairness and prosperity can go hand in hand. In fact, I'd put it much more strongly than that. I think fairness and prosperity must go hand in hand. And of course, 
the Scottish Government's approach is part of a growing international consensus. IMF research, which looked at 173 countries over 50 years, shows that more unequal countries tend to have lower and less durable economic growth. It's an argument that Mark Carney has endorsed. Christine Lagarde at the IMF has made it very strongly. Its principles underpin much of President Obama's economic policy in the US. It has profound implications here in the UK, which is currently the sixth most unequal country in the developed world. Now, Scotland on its own fares slightly better by nine places, but not nearly well enough. And there is overwhelming evidence that this degree of inequality harms our economy. The OECD estimated that inequality reduced the UK's economic growth by 9% between 1990 and 2010. It's basic common sense that as a society we will do better if we benefit from the skill, the talent and the innovation, not just of some of our people, but all of our people. And there are other reasons too. Higher incomes increase demand and boost the revenues needed for investment in infrastructure and education. More equal economies are more resilient and they're less likely to depend on borrowing and credit. And that reduces what's called failure demand in public services, meaning the state can spend more effectively on health, welfare and justice. And that's why the Scottish Government's Council of Economic Advisers, which includes uh, two Nobel laureates, Joseph Stiglitz and James Murleys, is currently uh, looking in detail at how the Scottish Government can create a fairer society using the powers we have. One thing we're absolutely clear on though is that the private sector is an absolutely essential partner in all of this. They're not only vital to but will also themselves benefit hugely from helping to build a fairer society. The Scottish Government already uh, works very closely with business, with the most competitive business tax system in the UK. Uh, we continue to support our enterprise agencies during a period when England abolished its regional development agencies. Uh, businesses play a major role in influencing our new economic strategy which we'll launch next month. Uh, but we're also encouraging and supporting business to contribute to a fairer society. Uh, and we argue that's in their best interest. Gender equality is a good example of that. Uh, there, of course, the Scottish Government is leading by example. My cabinet is one of only three in the developed world to have a 50-50 gender split. Uh, we're also launching a major drive called 50-50 by 2020 to encourage gender equality in public, private and third sector boardrooms. And we're removing, uh, are seeking to remove some of the key structural problems facing women in the workforce. For example, by planning a major expansion of childcare. That meets a key demand from employers. Just at the tail end of last year, the CBI called for a major expansion of childcare from the age of one onwards. Uh, and that was a clear recognition that a shortage of childcare doesn't just prevent parents, primarily mothers, from returning to work. It also deprives businesses of skilled and experienced workers. We've also, in the Scottish Government, got a clear focus on the quality of work, people's experience in the workplace. Uh, we, as a government, already pay the living wage to all of the people we employ and to everybody who works in the National Health Service. We use procurement policy wherever we can to encourage its use in all public sector contracts. Uh, and we're funding now the Poverty Alliance to run a very ambitious scheme for accrediting living wage employers. The scheme already covers more than 100,000 employees across Scotland, 100 companies are already signed up. And they're being persuaded that fair pay is good for their employees, good for their reputation, and also good for their bottom line. We're working with business and trade unions to set up a fair work convention to establish a Scottish business pledge. That pledge enshrines what I think is a fundamentally important principle. Just as government will work with business, with trade unions, to create a prosperous and strong economy, so too can business play a part in delivering a flourishing and a fair society. Essentially, what we're doing is appealing to companies' sense of enlightened self-interest. In doing so, we're encouraging them to commit to good business practices like innovation or internationalisation and to good employment practices like the living wage, gender equality or supporting workforce engagement. And there's really good evidence that that consensual partnership approach to economic development works. 
It mirrors good practice that you'll already find in Germany and other successful European countries. Its emphasis on fairness and equality is in line with recent research and it builds on steps we've taken previously in Scotland which already enjoy success. I mean, I spoke about productivity earlier and the challenges around productivity. Uh, a focus on productivity has been at the heart of our economic strategy and we've worked closely with business, higher education and a range of others to boost skills and innovation. You know, if we cast our minds back eight years, Scotland's productivity was 6% behind the rest of the UK. Now it's almost exactly the same. And that's partly because of low growth in the rest of the UK, of course, and there's still a long, long way to go. And that's the point I want to emphasise. There is still a long way to go because our productivity is way below Sweden. It's 20% below Germany's. Uh, but nevertheless, we have made progress. In other areas, our performance is even stronger. Our international exports have increased by 20% in the last three years. We regularly outperform all parts of the UK, uh, except for London and the South East, for inward investment. And we're doing better than other countries in the UK on all major employment measures, lower unemployment and economic activity, inactivity and higher employment. So we've done a reasonably good job in the face of an incredibly difficult economic climate of protecting growth, improving the long-term potential of our economy and protecting social justice. And in doing so, we've consistently tried to set out an optimistic vision of how we can work together in Scotland for the common weal or the common good. And I think one reason why there is such a consensus in Scotland that the Scottish Parliament now needs substantial more powers is that people trust the Scottish Parliament to use those powers responsibly. You know, I mentioned at the start of my remarks the influence that Scots and the Scottish university system had on the foundation of this university. And it's one instance of Scotland setting an example which could be followed more widely across these islands. But that's not a one-way street, of course. Uh, very often we've learned from what has happened elsewhere. Indeed, earlier this week I announced a new initiative to close the attainment gap in our schools, which draws very heavily on experience here in London. But just at the moment, after a momentous 12 months in Scotland, we will see a hugely significant 12 months ahead of us across the whole of the UK. And I hope that Scotland can again exert a beneficial and a progressive influence on developments here in London. And the message I want to leave you with today is that if we do that, We'll make the case for a more rational and more progressive economic policy at Westminster. We'll make the case in a way that perhaps uh, Labour parties of old would have made more emphatically than they do now. We'll make the case for that inextricable link between economic prosperity and social justice. And we'll use the powers we have in the Scottish Parliament to pursue that different approach, one based on partnership, fairness and prosperity, and we'll seek to lead by example, because if that approach can take root more widely, it will, and I hope it does help to halt the deeply misguided march to further austerity at Westminster. And if we can achieve that, then in my view that's something that will undoubtedly bring benefits to Scotland, but I think it will bring benefits to the rest of the UK as well. So that's my message to you this afternoon. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your questions.